Welcome to Football Night in Chicago. Let's get right into it with tonight's top stories. There's going to be another quarterback with Super Bowl experience on the market. Chicagoland native Jimmy Garoppolo. Well, 49ers head coach Kyle Shanahan says he doesn't see any scenario where Jimmy G returns to San Francisco. There's no room in the infirmary with two other quarterbacks on the men. College football. Alabama appears to have its eyes set on South Bend. First next offensive coordinator, Notre Dame and Lake Forest alum Tommy Reese was in Tuscaloosa today. Nick Saban trying to close the deal, looking to replace Bill O'Brien, who returned to New England to run the Patriots offense. Tommy Reese may be on his way out at Notre Dame. And how about this? Out with Columbus Day, in with Super Bowl Monday? Yeah, it could legitimately happen in Tennessee, where lawmakers introduced a bill that would replace the Columbus Day holiday with the day after the Super Bowl. Every NFL city would love that. I'm David Haw. This is Football Night in Chicago, and we've got a packed show for you, so let's get right to it. Welcome to Football Night in Chicago, powered by Points Bet. We have got a lot to talk about tonight. From the fallout, from the GOAT's retirement to the guy standing out for the Bears down in Mobile, Alabama at the Senior Bowl. So let's get started and dive in with our expert, our resident guy, head coach, Dave Wanstead, joins us now. Hey, coach, how you doing tonight? I'm great, David. As always, it's always good to be uh, good to be on and particularly with you. So let's, uh, what do you want to talk about? I'm a little confused, Dave. I'm used to talking to you on Tuesday mornings on the Mullion Haw Show, but I'm staying up late to talk to you tonight. It feels like late. Let's talk right now about Tom Brady. You are the guy. Let's let's be honest here. You taught Tom Brady his first lesson, and after his second career start <laughs> against the Miami Dolphins, 30 to 10, they you guys beat them. Tom Brady learned his lesson. First of all, what do you remember about that game in 2001? Because as you, as we all saw after that, Tom Brady in the second start wasn't so good, but then he became the greatest quarterback ever. I guess, David, the, the lesson there is uh, be careful for what you wish for. You know, Drew Bledsoe was a starter, and obviously Drew was a heck of a player in the NFL. And when he got hurt, and it was announced that Tom Brady was going to start and he hadn't been a starter before. We obviously thought he was just going to be another guy, another young player, late round, middle round draft pick, fifth round, sixth round draft pick that uh, had to fill in until Bledsoe got back. Well, little did we know, and uh, <laughs> the rest is history. The rest is history. Seven Super Bowls later, he's known as the greatest ever. Dave, I was telling Molly this morning, Doug Coletti, the guy at WBBM stats expert, came up with this one. 333 times Tom Brady started a, a game in the NFL. And 332 time, 333 times his team was in playoff contention. Never, co never started a game where his team was mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. When you talk about success and consistency and maintaining a level and a standard, nothing says it better than that. No, if you talk to people uh, inside any organization, you know, whether it was that Tom was associated with New England or Tampa, either one, uh, you know, it, it's the stuff that happens away from the football field that everybody talks about that Tom does, that Tom has, that truly separates him. And by that, I mean uh, the sense of urgency every day to go out there and uh and get better and, and and be prepared not just showing up and practicing but when he walks in the building you know the, the stories go and i talk to people in Tampa. i mean if if you're the weight coach you're on you're on edge you start lifting getting those guys weights if you're the equipment guy you're getting the equipment out quicker i mean it, it's assistant coaches head coaches everybody within the organization Tom, a lot like Michael Jordan, he has that ability and has done it by leading the way and moving everyone's play to a higher level. This is the underrated part of his legacy that I really enjoy and appreciate. He was a sixth round draft pick, 199th overall. So you look at how many teams, how many scouts, how many executives were wrong about him, the measurables, as they say. Now, that's one aspect to it, Dave. But the other one is, 
every quarterback that followed after he had a degree of success, every under overachieving quarterback, every guy that was maybe didn't have the strongest arm, who maybe was had the instincts and the intelligence, he gave them hope. He was the guy that gave every every player that was you know a a, a, a blue chip player above the shoulders the the idea that he could succeed. He was Brock Purdy before Brock Purdy was Brock Purdy. Yeah. How many times did you hear Tom Brady's name being mentioned uh, in the same sentence as Brock Purdy last week leading into the the playoff game with the 49ers and the Eagles? So, yeah, I I, I think that, uh, you know, he's proven a lot, not just to himself, but I think he's been a real encouragement to other players, it doesn't matter really what the position and, and Tom was a quarterback, but you know, if, if you got the right intangibles uh, and, and you want it bad enough that you can get an opportunity. And when your opportunity comes, you got to take advantage of it. Last thing on Brady. Okay, Dave, you know, that feels like we've talked about this before. You're a coach every August, every July, you get that feeling. You want to be back. You want to be at camp. You want to be in the mix. You want to be with your guys. How is Tom Brady going to resist that this time around? Last year, his retirement lasted 40 days. How long will it last this year? Is it binding? Uh, I think it's binding. I truly do. I, I think that uh, his personal life, you know, I, 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 people tell me he's lost 15 to 20 pounds. I mean, you can see it in his face. Uh, there's a difference between p- b- showing competitiveness on the sidelines and being frustrated and being irritated on the sidelines. A big difference from a coach's perspective. And this year, it was frustration and it was irritation. Uh, so I hadn't seen that side of Tom before. So I, I think that he's smart enough and he's got some great opportunities, whether it be with Fox or business, that he said, you know, it is time, enough, enough. I don't want to go learn a new playbook and have to, you know, build relationship with new players. I've been there. I've done that. It's time to move on. I think he's broken his last iPad. I agree. I, I agree. All right, Dave, <laughs> let's, let's look at the Bears. Down in Alabama, Luke Getze is getting a chance to be the head coach uh, of the American team, I believe. And you had that experience in 1996. I think it's great for an offensive coordinator to get the experience of being a head coach, especially somebody as young and successful as Luke Getze is. What's the overall value of this experience for Getze personally and for the Bears professionally because he gets a firsthand look at some guys who represent the rank and file of the NFL. You know what? As we were talking, a text just came in from Luke because I texted him earlier. I just happened to be sitting there and I put on uh, ESPN and they were interviewing him. And I thought he did a great job. He was asking, they were asking the same questions you were, David. And, and Luke was talking about how good the staff was. You know, he was talking about having a, a, a relationship to walk around and get the big picture of what was going on. Uh, and then he just talked about the, uh, you know, the X and O part of it, the different practice organization things that they were going through in today's practice and all week long. So, you know, I, I thought he handled it well. And you could tell with the way he was talking that, that it was a, a big learning experience. And I think that'll I think that'll help not just him, but I think it'll help you know, Matt Eberflus and the rest of the Bears, because now you've got a guy that's, even though it's just one week taste, he's had a little taste of, of what it's like to sit in that chair and, and have to deal with other coaches and deal with players and deal with practice plans and guys getting hurt. All the things that go into being a head coach that you really don't jump in with both feet when you're an assistant. Anytime you want to shoot him a text, they appear on Football Night in Chicago or the Moline Haas Show, Hey, we'll be very uh, grateful, Dave, if you want to do that maybe after the show. Uh, but let's look at the obvious reason that he's down there. He gives him a chance to evaluate talent up close and personal. Dave, when you did it back in 96, I think you ended up having a, an impression made by Walt Harris, Bobby Ingram, guys who Bears fans of a certain age remember very well. The Bears got four mm-hmm. players there last year because they were able to maybe see what they had to offer. How important is that aspect? Because now you've got a voice in Luke Getzey's that can be stronger in the draft room, in the war room, when they're picking players. 
Yeah, and there's a big difference between, you know, everybody's down there watching these kids practice. Everybody's can watch the film, the game film from their college days. But when you're hands-on coaching it, as we were, uh, you're in those meetings. You're, you're truly seeing how this kid's responding uh, when the tape's on. You know, is he taking accountability? Does he understand what you're talking about? Is he coachable? Uh, you know, in the dining hall. Now you're in there and the only coaches that can eat in there are the player coaches that are that are coaching the game. So now you're sitting in there with these players from all over the country. And, you know, I took it as a way of just observing and you're having conversations with guys away from football. So there's so much uh, that you can grasp from that, that this gives you, that strengthens your gut feeling for one way or another saying, you know what? This is a guy that we want on our football team uh, because he's going to help us win and he's going to be the right player to fit in. You're the best, Dave. Thanks for your time tonight, Coach. Okay, David. Talk to you later. We'll get Luke on there. All right. I'll hold you to that. The mornings, too. Okay. Dave Wanstead, okay. our expert here at Football Night in Chicago. When we come back, we'll take a trip to the land of barbecue where the Chiefs fans have gotten their swagger back. This is Football Night in Chicago, powered by Points Bet. Let's look at our stat of the day brought to you by Ankin Law. Super Bowl 57 is a matchup of the top seeded teams in each conference, which maybe surprisingly does not happen that often. The fact of the matter is this is the only 14th time since seeds were implemented in 1975 that the top two seeds have faced off in the Super Bowl. And when they do meet, the NFC usually comes out on top. They are nine and four in the conference. That includes the last time it happened, the 2017 season, 2018 Super Bowl. When the Eagles pulled out the Philly special to upset, upset the Tom Brady-led Patriots. You remember that one. Will that trend continue? Our next guest certainly doesn't hope so. Let's go to the beat. Kansas City, Fox 4's Marcus Officer. Marcus, how are you? And what is the mood and vibe in Kansas City getting ready for this Super Bowl? I'm doing quite well. I can tell you this. Let me start off by saying something before I lose confidence thinking about the Eagles and how good they've been. Philadelphia. All right. If you thought Will Smith slapping Chris Rock was an embarrassing <laughs> moment, just you wait until you realize that Kansas City is the rock that slaps back. Wow. I say that because that's how confident we are now 
go into next week. It's when the adrenaline settles down from the emotional game that the Chiefs played against the Bengals. I think now we're limping into the Super Bowl, and there's some around the uh, Chiefs kingdom that are concerned about that. Okay, against the Bengals, the edge was sharpened because of the whole Burrowhead Stadium stuff, and the Bengals talked a lot of trash going in. Eagles, a little more respectful so far, a little bit more of the team that is not going to be phased by much of anything. They do come from Philly. That is a pretty tough town. How will the Chiefs get that motivation that you're talking about? Where does that sort of swagger come from? Just being in Kansas City because you have Patrick Mahomes? That, that's part of it. I mean, the Mahomes magic is real. The way that he's been able to overcome, not this injury, but uh, injuries throughout his career, he's always shown up in big games. So when you know your quarterback, even on one leg, no matter what they're putting on that thing so he can walk straight. Uh, as long as he's going, everyone else seems to follow that lead. Uh, and then you have the Andy Reid effect. Andy Reid spent 14 years in Philadelphia. He almost got to the Super Bowl a handful of times, got there once and lost. That exit was not the prettiest considering what he had put in. There's so much respect and admiration for what Andy Reid has done here in Kansas City for what he's done in his career. I think they would crawl through glass at all, I can make it. I can say that. They will crawl through glass for that man. They will do whatever they can to win for him because a win for Andy Reid over his old team, I think, is the cherry on top of what's been a terrific career. Tell me this. How big of a factor is that to Andy Reid? I know it's early in the, in the mm -hmm. countdown, but it has to matter. This is the team he had a lot of success. This is the mm -hmm. team that fired him a decade ago. How much <laughs> does that matter in the preparation? He'll downplay it. He's been there, done that. He understands more than I think most coaches will what the preparation for two weeks can do. I think the record he had coming out of a bye was like 40-something and four. I don't know, some ridiculous number. When Andy Reid has time to prepare, he will have his team ready. It's just a matter of are the injuries in Kansas City going to be too much to overcome? You have three receivers hurt. You have a couple of key members on defense hurt, one in luxurious need. Your best corner is dealing with a concussion. How do you stop A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith without your best corner? The rookies have stepped up, but it's going to come down to some of the old vets like Chris Jones and the elevation of the games of the cornerbacks and the secondary for Kansas City. But Andy Reid, that factor is there. It's just a matter of can the young guys meet the moment. We both know those injuries that you mentioned are important, but they can be – kind of uh, invalidated or made inconsequential if Patrick Mahomes ignores or plays through his pain and injury the way he did in the AFC Championship game. How much better will he be Super Bowl Sunday, and what is the state of his ankle? They're keeping that as close to the chest as possible. I think uh, the Chiefs have always done a good job of protecting their guys. They continue to do that. Ankle Watch 2023 is what we call the Patrick Mahomes coverage of uh, since um, – Arden Key fell on his leg sideways a few weeks ago. That extra week of preparation and rehab is going to be crucial. He's been walking around. He's been looking good at practice. And he knows what this moment is. I think he appreciates it more. He said that last week. You know, you think you go into the league, you win MVP, and you win a Super Bowl, you just do it. That's not the case. Now he's putting the work in behind the scenes even more so than he did. So he's going to come out ready to go even if he had one leg or two good ones. Marcus, like a lot of people, I wondered how this offense would function without Tyree mm -hmm. Kill. I wondered if Patrick Mahomes might level off a little bit, relatively speaking, <laughs> without Tyree Kill. Instead, here he is, back at the Super Bowl. Does going mm -hmm. to the Super Bowl, winning the AFC, validate everything they did to trade Tyree Kill, not keep him? Because at the time, there was a lot of – talk, a lot of conversation. Did they do the right thing? And will we see a drop off? Well, here they are. I mean, 5,000 yards and another 45 total touchdowns. I mean, this is best season since his first year as a starter. No one, or I should say very few thought that was possible this off season. The talk was the Raiders, the Broncos, the Chargers, their opportunity is now to knock off the Chiefs because Tyreek Hill's gone. This was one of the few win-win trades that you've seen in the NFL. The Dolphins got a number one who was second in the league in receiving and still an explosive player. In return, the Chiefs got an opportunity to get five, five good draft picks, turn those guys into quality starters, and open up the offense because now you don't know which way they're going to attack you. Do you know all the names? Well, no. Marcus Kemp, who's that? He may catch a touchdown in the Super Bowl. Jord uh, Jordy Fortson. Maybe he will too, but when you have Travis Kelsey, I think he was the linchpin to the offense. 
with Mahomes pulling the strings and having those two was the biggest difference. We missed Tyreek. We missed the cheetah and the backflips, but this team's look pretty good without them. Yeah, and you look at the Eagles offensive line with Kelsey's brother. That is not going to be the same as playing the Bengals in their patchwork collection of backup offensive linemen that the Chiefs took care of rather handily. Is that why you're so confident because of that display against Joe Burrow? It's going to get different against the Eagles. You step up in class. There's not going to be a lot of holes in that offensive line. Can the Chiefs pass rush harass Jalen Hurts in the way they did Joe Burrow? We hope so. When you have Frank Clark, who we know turns it up at the playoffs, and for the most part this season, that's the only time we've seen him play well, but he's clicking. Chris Jones waited 13 games to get his first two sacks in the playoffs, and he's eager to continue to add to that number. And then you have rookie Furious George, one of the best nicknames, George Karloff, <laughs> and on the other side. If he can continue to elevate his game and at least put enough pressure on Jalen Hurts, who's been great, by the way, utmost respect, but it's going to be up to the defensive line to give these rookie corners time to make sure that they can do what they need to do. It's about protecting the secondary because that's the unit that's banged up. And if anyone can get to the quarterback, it's Chris Jones, it's Frank Clark, and it's Furious George. Well, you're talking to somebody in Big Ten country. We remember Furious George from Purdue. So it's been great to see him have an impact as a rookie. All right. You know, you are also talking to somebody in Chicago. We are all contractually obligated when talking to somebody from Kansas City, to ask a Matt Nagy question. How much of a role has he played this year? And with so many offensive coordinator positions open around the league, could he be a guy that looks around and gets some interest because he is a former head coach, he is a guy who has called plays before, do you think Matt Nagy will be looking around, or is he going to be replacing Eric Bieniemy if Bieniemy is on the move? Well, how could you not, if your team, look at Matt Nagy? He's been absolutely great. In fact, he was the common thread between Patrick Mahomes' first uh, big season, his growth as a rookie. He was there for that. And when he's come back, Patrick Mahomes elevated his game. Now, Eric Bieniemy definitely deserves the opportunity. Uh, that's an entirely different story to figure out why he hasn't had a coaching job just yet. But when you're in a position to coach Patrick Mahomes, learn from Andy Reid, and be on a team that's going to win at least 12 games every year, I think that beats at least a third of open NFL head coaching jobs. Andy Reid, who knows how much longer he'll be doing it, but they will want to keep Matt Nagy there considering what he means not only to the players, what he means to that coaching staff, and that little stint he had in Chicago. It wasn't great. I mean, Mitchell Trubisky, that still <laughs> stings that they picked him over Patrick Mahomes. That Ouch. said, I think he does get another opportunity to look, but why lead Kansas City to have another – maybe mediocre head coaching job when you can get another year or two with Patrick Mahomes as your quarterback. Marcus, thank you for sharing your swagger with Chicago. <laughs> Enjoy the build up to Super Bowl 57. Let's hope these words don't come back to bite me. I don't want to be told to shut up Jabroni because uh, Kansas City, <laughs> they've been here, done that. It's nice to see them again. We've seen them lose a Super Bowl. We've seen them win one too. Let's get back into that win column. Three years ago today, Chiefs won Super Bowl 55, I believe. And then the pandemic happened. Let's hope that doesn't repeat itself either, though. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Marcus Officer from Fox 4 in Kansas City. One last break here on Football Night in Chicago. Could the next quarterback in Tampa Bay be coming from Green Bay? Those odds after the break.
Just a day after Tom Brady retired from the NFL, allegedly, Robert Kraft wants him to do it again. Kinda. The Patriots owner was on CNN this morning where he said he would sign the future Hall of Famer to a one-day contract so Brady could retire a Patriot. Not only do I want it, our fans are clamoring for it. And to us, he is always has been and always will be a Patriot. And we will be bringing him back um, after I have not. I don't like to make a commitment for him, but we will do everything in our power to bring him back, have him sign off as a Patriot, nice. and find ways to honor him for many years to come. Brady's retirement adds even more intrigue to an already fascinating quarterback market. So let's take a look at tonight's best bet powered by points bet with Tom Brady done. The Bucks are now in the quarterback conversation too. One potential target, yeah. football diva Aaron Rodgers. Points bet gives them the third best odds to land the four-time MVP if he even leaves Green Bay, of course. The Raiders check in at number two, and there's a certain Raider who would like to have Mr. Rodgers in Vegas in Mr. Rodgers' neighborhood which with Devontae Adams also lives, should he move into the same city. This is going to be a fun few months in the NFL with the quarterback carousel. That's going to do it for us tonight here on Football Night in Chicago, powered by PointsBet. Stay tuned. Have a great night. Bulls pregame live is next.